it says, there are no moral obligations on any of us except when we put them on ourselves. So we are by nature free without external artificial bonds. We are by nature unbound by moral constraints. The only moral constraints that limit our liberty, that uh, are external constraints on our choice based on the desires we have to do, are those bonds that we put ourselves on. And why, of course, does Hobbes think we would ever do that? So this is like the big picture for Hobbes. There are no moral constraints on any of us except those that we put ourselves under. Why would we ever put ourselves under any? <clears throat> Why would we do that? So the laws of nature are telling us to do this and telling us how to do this. Why would we do that? Yeah. This is in our best interest for survival. Exactly. Because this is how we will better satisfy our most important desires. So morality is imposed on us by ourselves out of our own self-interest. Okay, back to our question now. Uh, so what liberty, if any, do we have against the sovereign? Well, continuing here, it says, because such arguments, so, sorry, so the only source of limits on our liberty are taken from our covenants, the voluntary. And so if we look to what we covenant, we'll be able to see what we can and can't do against the sovereign. And because such arguments must be drawn from the express words, I authorize all his actions, or from the intentions of him that submitted himself to the power, the obligation and liberty of the subject is to be derived either from those words, or others equivalent that have to be exactly the words I submit, or else from the end of the institution of the sovereign, the goal that we have in establishing sovereignty, namely the peace of the subjects within themselves and their defense against the common enemy. And therefore, the very bottom of the page, it's obvious, he says, to manifest that every subject has liberty in all those things the right thereof cannot by covenant be transferred. So everything that we have an inalienable right to, the parts of the right of nature that we cannot transfer, we still have a right to. And so those parts of the right of nature that we have an inalienable right to, we have the liberty to act on, even if the sovereign says otherwise, because we still have that right. Because it's an ailment. And what's an example of one of those rights? Self-defense. So the right to, I, I would say, to at least immediate physical self-defense is something that is inalienable. And therefore, Hobbes draws the natural conclusion here. I've already shown before in the 14th chapter that covenants not to defend a man's own body are void. Therefore, if the sovereign man, sorry, if the sovereign command a man, though justly condemned, and so the sovereign's not doing anything wrong, and the sovereign commands that individual to kill, wound, or maim himself, or not to resist those that assault him, or to abstain from the use of food, air, medicine, or any other thing without which he cannot live, yet hath that man the liberty to disobey because we have an, because we have an inalienable right to defend ourselves even against what the sovereign says 
And therefore, we have the liberty to disobey the bond that the sovereign uh, attempts to impose on us to do this. Clear? All right, so this I described a couple minutes ago as a sort of dangling thread that, in my opinion, really threatens to unravel the whole structure. And you can sort of see why, because it's not just when we're immediately attacked and our life is in physical danger that we can disobey. Look further down on at paragraph 15. No man is bound by the words themselves either to kill himself or any other man. It can be dangerous. You don't have to put yourself in physical danger trying to go and kill somebody else. And consequently, that the obligation a man may sometimes have upon the command of the sovereign to execute any dangerous or dishonorable office, dependent not on the words of our submission, but on the intention which is to be understood by the end thereof, which is to survive. So if the sovereign tells me to kill myself, I don't have to do it. I have a right to do it. If the sovereign tells me to go kill somebody else, I think that's dangerous. I don't have to do that either. And over on 143, it gets even worse here, or better, depending on how you look at it. It says, to resist the sword of the commonwealth in defense of another man, guilty or innocent, he says, no man hath a reason. Because such liberty takes away from the sovereign the means of protecting us and is therefore destructive of the very essence of government. So, you don't have a right to disobey the sovereign, he's saying here, because um, uh, that would under undermine uh, the stability of the uh, commonwealth. But, he says, that, that would be unjust. <clears throat> but, in case a great many men together have already resisted the sovereign power unjustly, or committed some capital crime for which every one of them expects death, whether have they not the liberty then to join together and assist and defend one another? So there's a bunch of people who have been unjust and now are threatened with punishment, execution, let's say, by the sovereign. Don't they have the right to defend themselves jointly? Certainly they have, for they but defend their lives, which the guilty man may as well do as the innocent. There was, he says, indeed, injustice in the first breach of their duty, their bearing of arms subsequent to it, though it be maintained, be to maintain what they have done, is no new unjust act. And if it be only to defend their persons, it's, no un, it's not unjust at all. But the offer of pardon uh, taken from them, to whom it's offered the plea of self-defense, so if they're pardoned, then they don't have any excuse. So we can join up with a band of outlaws to resist the commands of the, of the sovereign if we think doing that is going to protect our lives. And one more thing, just a second, over on 144. The obligation of subjects to the sovereign is understood to last as long and no longer then the power lasteth by which he's able to protect them. For the right men have by nature to protect themselves, when none else can protect them, can by covenant, sorry, can by no covenant be relinquished. Okay, so we're bound to the sovereign. And a rebellion, you can decide whether you're secure, how your security is going to be best protected. And what I just read. The obligation that we have to the sovereign lasts only as long as the sovereign is able to protect us. If the sovereign is no longer able to protect us, well then, we have a right to protect ourselves. That's something that we can't give up. That's something that's part of our inalienable right. Okay, I can see from your questions that you recognize that this is a disaster for Hobbes. Why? Because it kind of seems like if, if enough people decide to be unjust and rebel, yep. 
and you feel that to stay with sovereign makes you less safe, yep. you have a right to join the rebels, even though it breaks your country. Right, so I think that's right. I think, I think that's exactly what Hobbes is saying, that if there are enough people who are rebelling, well, on the one hand, what they're doing is unjust. But on the other hand, if they can establish, as it were, facts on the ground so that they do a better job protecting you than the old sovereign, well, join up. Join up. Okay. Sorry? I was wondering about the army. If you said that if a person claims that it's a dangerous activity, yeah. so therefore there can be no army. So Everybody's going to call it a soldier, you know, going into a battle. Yeah. Right? There's going to be no battles. Well, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. So, sorry. So this, um, let's say, greatly diminishes the power of the sovereign. In fact, you might say, it really greatly diminishes the power of the sovereign. Because, well, because, um, put it this way, who is deciding whether to obey the sovereign's commands? Each individual. And whose judgment is each individual relying on to decide whether to obey the sovereign's commands? Well, the sovereign says, go fight. And do you have to? If you're a enlisted soldier, yeah. You got an inalienable right. He says, he says enlisted soldiers give up the right to self-defense. They can't flee in battle. I remember reading that specifically. Well, I'm not sure. I mean, subjects have an inalienable right to self-defense. Volunteer soldiers, yeah. But he says, so, he says specifically in there if they enlist and they give up their like right to flee in battle. Okay, well, so, what, I mean, so there's, there's, um, right. Um, there's no contradiction in saying that the sovereign has a right to command and saying that you have a liberty to disobey. That's not a sort of logical contradiction. We're saying that the sovereign doesn't have any obligation to do anything. The sovereign. The sovereign. The sovereign, isn't sovereign has no obligation to come to the government. But then he says, if he can't protect you, then you're not going to him. That's right. So, you, so the question is, what obligation subjects are under? The sovereign has no obligation. Hobbes, I don't think, ever says that the sovereign has any kind of limitation on liberty. But the question is whether subjects have a duty or obligation to obey. And, and you're right. On the one hand, it certainly looks like all over the place he's saying they do. But on the other hand, in these passages, he's pretty clearly saying that individuals, how are they going to decide whether to obey or not?